At the same time, I was just talking about how critically important ideas are in the environmental world and understanding people's worldviews. But we also want to understand that ideas are not everything, right? Ideas are not all powerful. Um, I sometimes have a critique for people that think that just by properly describing a cultural or environmental issue, just by properly identifying it and finding the right way to talk about it, that we're sort of going to, of course, solve or at least contribute to solving the problem. I think that's a tempting um, line of thought, particularly for academics uh, who live and work in a world of discourse and ideas, but it's important to recognize um, that ideas aren't everything when it comes to environmental issues, and it is very possible uh, for people to have the same environmental worldview and come to very different places um, based on their economic needs, their structural realities, their political limitations. It is not all about ideas because we don't live in some sort of abstract space of only ideas. There are economic, physical realities of people's lives, structural realities. Um, a good example is that case study I mentioned the other week and that you also read really briefly about in the Townsend reading about the last uh, northern cod where it was talking about the collapse of the east coast Newfoundland um, cod population in the 80s and 90s. This wasn't, as is brought out in the original article, this really wasn't a factor of people changing their view of the fish. Uh, presumably both before and after people um, respected the fish as an important part of their livelihood, and probably a lot of people respected it on kind of a emotional level, as a lot of fishers do, right? A healthy respect for the animal that you're fishing. Certainly when I fish, I find it to be a very, um, an experience that helps me feel closer to nature, 100% people's beliefs didn't cause the collapse of the fishery. People's beliefs didn't really change in a 20 year period. What changed was technology. Um, people had the same, had economic needs as they did previous to this to have profitable fishing boats and to make a living. But then technology was developed that allowed them to do that much more efficiently, specifically certain kinds of sonar tech that would go along with trawlers and allow them to much more rapidly and efficiently um, Uh, and so you had this collapse of the uh, collapse of this cod species as a result of new technology and existing economic incentives. Again, not because of people's ideas. So ideas aren't everything, right? And we could talk about many, many examples. Um, uh, environmental geographer Ishiyama wrote a great paper about Skull Valley Gushu tribe and. It's kind of a long story, but basically there was consideration being given by some of the tribal leaders to potentially, not even for sure, but potentially um, accepting a deal with the Department of Energy, the U.S. Department of Energy, to house certain old nuclear storage waste that doesn't have a home because nobody wants nuclear storage waste by their community um, or in their favorite spots. And so this tribe was considering that, and um, there was a lot of blowback um, from other people within Utah about this nuclear waste. Um, people felt like that was very um, environmentally problematic and, you know, don't bring that stuff in, near our areas, um, even though it would have been on go shoot land. And Ishiyama kind of brings up a point, and I would may, maybe add a little bit to the point as well, that part of what was going on there is people kind of have a lens through which they sometimes view uh, native peoples and native nations, uh, one of which is the assumption that native peoples will always take a um, stance against what's viewed as pollution or environmental disruption. Uh, in this case, that people were almost viewing it as sort of um, contrary to those ideals or ideas. Uh, Ishiyama, I think, brings up a number of relevant points, one of which is the concept of landscapes of injustice, basically saying that um, Skull Valley Gushu had had so many different structural constraints um, over the years historically that had led to a situation of low employment and poverty on the reservation. Um, whether that be a huge constriction of the land base to a very small reservation where it's impossible to have done the traditional subsistence economy once you're on that small of land, whether that be hunting and fishing limits, whether that be um, you know big distance from the necessary infrastructure and population centers to really have viable businesses, whether that's the legal and property restraints that are put on reservations that make economic development more difficult. Um, 
so you can't look at that in isolation. You can't look at that in isolation and conclude something about skull value Gashut, people's views about the environment. You have to put it in a bigger context that includes, yes, traditional views, of course, but also economic constraints and colonialism and um, histories of sort of isolation and economic disenfranchisement. Uh, so again, ideas aren't everything, but ideas are something. Right? Ideas are something. Ideas can be, in some contexts, incredibly powerful in understanding the environmental decisions people make. A good example of this is Rachel Carson's uh, famous book, Silent Spring, uh, in which, in uh, 1962, was it? Uh, Rachel Carson wrote this book. She was a marine biologist as well as a conservationist. Uh, she wrote a book about the rampant use of pesticides in the U.S., including, and this is the part people would typically remember, the pesticide DDT, which was a very popular anti-mosquito pesticide that had been developed a couple of decades previous and was being used uh, pretty extensively in the agriculture industry, as well as by some cities to control mosquito populations. Um, and Carson brought up that this pesticide, as well as a lot of others, that there was a lot of evidence emerging, both anecdotal and lab evidence, to suggest that these were uh, these pesticides that were being used so much in cities, in fields, um, sometimes in ways that would seem almost very foreign to us nowadays, like sort of broadcast pesticide spraying across cities, um, that that was very that this was viewed by some people as very innocuous, but was actually very, very toxic and leading to really serious issues across the ecosystems. Um, one of which famously was the thinning of um, eagle eggs leading to coll help contributing to collapsing numbers of bald eagles, which definitely got American attention, of course. Um, she talks about, she used a really powerful metaphor in that story of sort of the silent spring, right? And a spring in which we no longer hear robins singing. Um, because the DDT has harmed their egg production so seriously, or where we see a bunch of dead robins on the ground. C Carson had a way with words. Carson had a tremendous way with words. She was a very good writer. And it really galvanized public attention, and it helped lead to, about a decade after the publication of the book, the banning of the DDT for most uses within the United States. It still gets used in some other parts of the world, uh, particularly to combat malaria in parts of Africa, um, but here in the U.S. it was mostly banned, and that was in large part because of Carson's bringing this to the public attention and helping to shift people's attention away from this idea of sort of chemical pesticides as a scientific wonder and towards this idea of sort of um, chemicals is very, very dangerous. And that became a prevailing discourse to the point where uh, for many Americans today, um, they hear, you know, chemical pesticide or artificial chemical or something like that. And that almost inspires revulsion, right? And a lot of people, when they go to the grocery store, are intentionally trying to look for things like organic labeling or other things that might be associated with fewer artificial chemicals. Now, the narrative I just told you was a really simplified one. There have been a lot of other things that have fed into American distrust of synthetic chemicals, other than Rachel Carson's book. And there's a lot of things even that fed into the banning of DDT, including certain earlier scholars and activists who had brought up concerns with DDT. And certainly uh, there was even already in by the 50s, like magazines and stuff like that, that were talking about like, careful with your DDT in your home, like use DDT insecticides, but don't use them too much because that can straight up kill you. Um, so it wasn't as if Carson was the first one to bring up the dangers of DDT by a long stretch, nor is it the case as we sometimes tend to think that 1950s Americans were just sort of completely laissez-faire about chemicals and always trusted chemicals just because they came from scientists. Uh, it kind of makes it a nice narrative, right? It makes a nice narrative of sort of over-trust of science in the 1950s and then the environmentalist backlash to that in the 60s. Um, in reality, Carson was part of a bigger puzzle, but the point, but nonetheless, the point holds that her book was very transformative at the time, caught a lot of people's attention, and helped further move the needle to eventually affecting major environmental change, as well as a whole series of laws in the 60s and 70s, um, which would forever alter the U.S. by giving us much more specific laws with how we deal with things like water pollution and air pollution. Much of the laws that, um, whatever your personal opinions about them, uh, 
protect or regulate water and air quality and soil quality here in the United States and pollution issues. Much of that legal apparatus was developed in the 70s, uh, and Carson's book was one part of many that contributed that. Uh, so was being able to view the world from a distance from photos by astronauts. People have brought up the fact that that was also something that, that was used as like a big symbol on Earth Day in 1970 as this sort of major moment for the environmental movement in the U.S. where it was gaining broad recognition and momentum. But they used the world symbol on their flags, the entire Earth, the image from the astronauts. And people have brought up that it seems so natural to us now to be able to look at a photo of the Earth from space but at the time, it was a really revolutionary kind of thing, right? And it really just drove home the point for a lot of people that we got one of these, right? We got one Earth, one blue island. And uh, if we screw it up, we screw it up. So power of ideas can sometimes be transformative. So how then do we um, approach ideas? What are ways of talking about environmental knowledge? Um, scholars, not just anthropologists, although I use that term a lot because of my own backing as an anthropologist, but scholars who study culture and ecology um, have come up with a lot of different models. Um, I'm going to talk about three that I think are important for you to understand. The first of which is social constructionism. You have probably heard this term because it's a highly influential idea. You've probably heard terms like the social construction of gender or the social construction of race, especially if you've taken a lot of um, social science kinds of courses or humanities kinds of courses. Um, and sometimes that term just kind of gets thrown around willy-nilly, social construction of blank. But it's actually a specific body of theory uh, that when it was first developed, there was a very kind of specific, it wasn't just saying sort of culture influences how you think, but it was kind of a more specific theory. And I'd like to try to explain it right now. Um, Berger and Luckman were two authors in the 1960s that really helped push forward this idea of social constructionism, although not the only ones. Um, they talked about the idea, they're two sociologists, and they talked about the idea that the way we experience reality is not sort of just a one-to-one -one correspondence of like, here's reality, I observe it through my senses, that's what reality is, right? That's certainly the way we've often thought about it. That was sort of one of the foundations of scientific method, the enlightenment, right? This idea of direct observation of the observable world and empirical phenomena. Berger and Luckman pointed out it's not entirely how human perception works. Instead, our perceptions are funneled through culture in complex ways. We have our own sorts of experiences or ideas about the world, our own ego, our own narratives, our own beliefs, and we externalize them, right? So long as they're just in our head, they're just in our head, but we externalize those. We communicate about those to other people. We write books, like Rachel Carson did when she wrote Silent Spring. Uh, we develop holy texts. We preach sermons. We give political speeches. We get our ideas out there, and certain ideas get more traction than others and eventually become part of the cultural discourse. And then eventually becomes, as they say, institutionalized, right? Things become hegemonic. They become mainstream. They become part of how we define reality, whether that's because it's embedded in, again, holy texts or embedded in law or embedded um, in a common expression. It becomes embedded in the social institutions that we experience growing up. Um, and that's, that's so it's externalized and objectified. And they then say also reified. And what they mean by that is that this cultural understanding of the world, we then endow it with authority. Um, one way that people sometimes describe it is we forget we make culture and then we forget that we made culture, right? We feed into this cultural milieu as human beings uh, of how we're going to represent the world, and then we treat that as if that's sort of the objective map of reality, when in reality, it's not necessarily the objective map of reality, it's our objective map of reality. So we treat that as if it's objective truth, even if it's something that's been heavily conditioned by cultural factors, including each of our own ways we contribute to those discourses. We treat that as reality with a capital R. And then people then go on to internalize these ideas, right? Once it becomes part of our school systems, once it becomes part of our discourse, our entertainment, we then soak that in and thus the cycle begins again, right? It becomes part of how individuals think about life and they just keep externalizing it, right? To put that a little more simply, we tell each other stories, and those stories can often become stories with a capital S, right? The dominant way of understanding something, and those stories become reality, right? They become what everybody agrees is reality in that society. An important implication of that is 
you can just hop, skip, and jump over to the next society over and find a completely different set of discourses that have become reified and become objective reality for that society, which is the reason, one reason, not the only reason, but one reason why there can be such vastly different ways of categorizing race in different societies. For example, one need only look at the different racial terminologies used in the United States, the Dominican Republic, and Brazil uh, to see that something that may seem just like obvious and straightforward to somebody living in the States is actually sometimes regarded very differently in other nations where they have different racial terminologies, some of which are the same, black and white, some of which are very different. Um, so that's social constructionism in a, in a nutshell. Many scholars have applied this to nature, to environmental problems, to suggest that Yes, there is a physical environment out there, right? I keep pointing outside my window. Um, yes, there's a physical environment out there. Yes, there's a physical dimension to pollution. Obviously, we can get sick and die from pollution. Uh, but there's also a strong cultural dimension to it where we understand it through a lens of culture. Um, that part of how we perceive or understand the risk of different things is a cultural product, um, as Mary Douglas points out. I saw this very clearly in some of my own research when I was working in North Texas at the University of North Texas in Denton, Texas. That's a lot of Texases in one sentence. Um, when I saw the profound ways in which people's individual experiences as well as cultural narratives influenced how they saw air quality in their area. Uh, so a little bit of background, Denton, Texas, uh, not to malign a uh, city that I used to live in, but has really bad uh, surface level ozone. So if you're not familiar with ozone, ozone up in the upper atmosphere equals good. It protects us from things like skin cancer, and that's one of the reasons why it was bad when there was the huge ozone hole, and why we are grateful that CFCs were largely banned and that the ozone holes have decreased significantly. Um, but ozone on the ground, <laughs> different thing, that can be very, very bad. Ozone up Upper atmosphere, good. Ozone close to where we are, very bad. Uh, because O3 or ozone, we breathe it in and it can cause all sorts of respiratory issues. It can aggravate uh, people's asthma and uh, mess with other kinds of respiratory issues as well, COPD, things like that. Um, so I did research along with a bunch of my students um, and also partnering with a medical anthropologist friend of mine. Uh, and we looked at... Um, the, my class, my students and I were looking at how people understood air pollution in their area. So they had some of the worst air pollution, uh, or they had really, really high levels of ozone pollution. It was even in many cases, many days it would be higher than Dallas, despite being a much smaller city. Their city was 150,000, give or take, versus the millions in the nearby Dallas-Fort Worth area. But for a variety of reasons, they had a much higher, or they sometimes had a higher level of ozone, or at least equivalent level of ozone. It was much more polluted than you would typically expect for a city of this size. There's a variety of environmental factors for that. But what I was, um, it was partly a result of a city that had grown much larger than its original blueprint, and so there was a lot of traffic congestion, but there was a lot of other factors as well, including the shape of the topography, the amount of sunlight, um, the fact that there were trucking stops on the outside of town. There's probably a lot of contributing factors. Um, my point wasn't to study it on that level, but instead to study how people perceived it. Um, we, for example, asked people, okay, one to 10, how do you perceive, how good is te Texas air quality? And we were surprised how many people, not everybody, but how many people said five, six, seven, eight, nine kind of numbers. I think our average ended up somewhere around seven or eight um, for a city that many days out of, the, not every day, but had a not insignificant number of uh, yellow and red air quality days, which means days where the state environmental people basically put out an advisory to say like, hey, if you're elderly or have asthma or something, you should probably stay indoors today, right? Uh, Denton, Texas on a given year oftentimes had a number of yellow days, occasionally some red days as well, which indicates pretty serious air quality concerns, but people often perceived it as pretty unpolluted. And it was interesting to see people's logic. So for example, when you would give out the survey, people would sometimes smell the air to determine if it was what the air quality was, like before they answered the question ozone is odorless. Well, it's not actually odorless, but at the quantities that we're talking about, it's odorless. So that was interesting. It was also interesting, particularly when we did interviews, to see that people that people that rated the air quality really high or felt like the air was really clean, they tended to be people that were from very large cities. And so they had come to Denton for college or work or different things. And they would point out things like, oh, well, you know, the college is like so environmentally friendly because UNT has 
really strong like environmental studies program, recycling program, things like that. Or, you know, Denton, like really green city, uh, even like the color of the university is green. Like that's their uh, mascot tree color. And, you know, people bring up like, oh, all the trees and stuff, right? Like this is a clean place to live, um, which are all kind of logical conclusions, but don't really mean that your air quality is good. And indeed it wasn't all that great there. Um, conversely, people that were from rural areas would sometimes say that the air quality was quite bad and their logic would be based on things like oh it's really crowded here well of course to somebody from a huge city denton didn't look very crowded at all it looked like a really small moderately sized city but to somebody from the rural outlying areas it looked like a really crowded city uh, if that's where they'd spent most of their life not only that but people would bring up like especially people from rural areas like oh i go for a run and like my my lungs feel heavy, right? Uh, so they had had a different experience of air growing up and their perception was that the city was more polluted than where they grew up. So my point with all of that is look at all the things that was part of the social construction of air quality in Denton and the social construction of air pollution. There was the actual observable scientific fact of the air pollution, but most people are not air quality scientists, right? Most people are not environmental scientists. They might go online and look for the AQI, the air quality data for any given day in their city or state. A lot of people don't though, right? And so they're relying on other kinds of things. Some of those things are their own physical senses of, and if, you know, and they may con have a kind of understanding of pollution as something you should be able to see or smell, and often it's not. Um, or they may be relying on sort of um, identities or narratives that we tell about places, right? This place is a is an environmentally friendly place. This place is a not environmentally friendly place. And that was influencing how people read pollution in the landscape, uh, sometimes in a way that was quite askew of the actual data of the air pollution. But because the city and the um, town had this kind of very environmental reputation, that was causing people to think that the air quality was better than it was. Um, so all of this brings up the point of sort of social constructionism. Um, I the idea that there is sort of an observable world out there, obviously, um, an empirical world out there, a physical world, but that it is funneled through culture and that what we experience as reality um, is oftentimes heavily shaped by those cultural filters that we put onto it. Now, I want to note that's not how everyone would describe social constructionism. Um, some people take a more hardline stance of social constructionism where there really is no knowable reality and instead sort of it's all culture all the way down it's all turtles all the way down as they say um but i'm more of a what we call soft social constructionist i definitely believe in a physical reality i believe that we can know that physical reality among other things through scientific means as well as our own observations but that our observations and our science are oftentimes structured pretty heavily um, through our culture it causes us to look at some things and not look at other things or perhaps um conceptualize things that other people might think are not there, but other people might think are. Uh, so a good example, you don't have to memorize this, I'll show this in a later lecture, but this is sort of a chart I did one time about you, some assumptions of US environmental policy and some assumptions within Diné ontology, within Navajo worldviews traditionally um, that were at odds. And I was using that to try to help explain the issue that you read about a couple of weeks ago with the Sacred Mountain. And one of the points I made was that in US environmental policy, pollution is something you can measure, right, empirically through a test tube, through a chemical test, right? And it exists in certain quantities that can then be limited, mitigated, or purified to certain levels. That was very different from the assumption that, yes, there is that kind of pollution, but there are also other kinds of pollution that have to do with ceremony, with sacred concepts, which are not so easily purified and which are not so easily measured, right? Um, more qualitative concepts. And so um, social constructions then are a powerful way in which we sort of filter reality, our views of reality. I think it's a powerful way to think about why cultures can have such different understandings of the same world. Um, there's a term that I love from one classic paper. They say every river is more than just one river. Every mountain is more than just one mountain. That's um, Tom Grader and Lorraine Garkovich, Landscapes, the Social Construction of Nature and the Environment. It's a great paper. I might have you read it later in the semester, actually. Um, so I think it's a good model. I think it's a helpful model to help us understand how people can come to such different conclusions about something like pilot whaling or protected lands or air quality in their community. At the same time, we want to be careful with social constructionist thought. I think there's some ways you could critique it. You might pause the video and ask how would you critique it. Um, 
one way that I would critique it, and that a lot of people have, is that sometimes it can verge on ignoring reality altogether. I don't think that's what was meant by Berger and Luckman when they originally developed this kind of idea, but I think sometimes when we really heavily focus on social constructionism and discourse and things like that, we can forget that nature is not, the environment is not just some sort of blank slate, a tabula rasa that we can just paint whatever on. Instead, in a very real sense, um, the environment pushes back, right? Um, I typically, people that live in dense forests don't look outside and say, hey, that's a desert, right? The physical reality would immediately contradict to them. Um, so my, although um, somebody that lives in a relatively arid Israel, area such as um, Israel and Palestine might look out at the landscape and call certain things w wilderness or wild uh, that to other people look a lot more like sort of um, semi-wilderness, um, right? Because it's an area where there's less tree cover. So yes, social constructions affect things, but there's also a degree to which just like the basic ecology out there influences, right? There's not like sort of infinite numbers of worldviews I can come up by looking outside my window. Um, I could say that I don't believe there are any salmon in Kenai River, and it doesn't change the fact that people get salmon out of the Kenai River all the time, right? So we want to be careful with this kind of thought, I think, and cautious with how we apply it, but I think it's a useful theory. And so I, I'd like you to think about sort of your own social construction of the environment. What's nature composed of to you? Also ask yourself some other questions. What's pollution? What counts as pollution? People sometimes say light pollution. Is that a thing? Can light be a pollution or only chemicals? Can there be spiritual pollution? What would that mean? Um, and how do we control pollution? Can we control pollution? And why does pollution matter? What steps should we take about pollution? These are fundamentally questions about your social construction of the environment. They are questions that cannot be answered solely through empirical testing. So it's worth knowing yourself and knowing other people as we deal with complex issues of pollution. Um, you know, because our ideas, they're powerfully shaped by our culture, um, and that's worth knowing. I'm going to pause the video here again.